Exploring the Titanic by Robert D. Ballard, Chapter 6, Solving the Mysteries. When we returned home after our 1986 expedition, our work had just begun. Now we had to look through the thousands of photographs and the hours and hours of videotape we had taken on the bottom. We wanted to see if we could shed any new light on the story of the Titanic. Perhaps we could help solve some of the mysteries that still surrounded this legendary ship. We'll probably never know for sure exactly what the iceberg did to the starboard bow of the Titanic. Too much of it is buried too deep in mud for anyone to see. But we did learn that some of the steel plates that covered the side of the ship have been knocked apart at their seams. It's likely that the iceberg made few holes on the ship's side, or not at all. Instead, it appears that the force of the iceberg banging against the ship made the steel plates burst apart, letting water rush in through the cracks. But whatever the exact nature of her ice wound, it was enough to sink the ship. Before we found the Titanic, most people thought that she had sunk in one piece. However, there were many eyewitnesses, including Jack Thayer, who reported that the ship had in fact broken in two. The bow plunging down while the stern righted itself for a moment before turning almost on end and then sinking a minute later. Since we found the Titanic sitting in two big pieces, 1,970 feet apart and pointing in almost different directions, it does seem almost certain that the ship broke apart at or near the surface. As the bow sank and the stern rose higher and higher out of the water, the stress on the hull became so great that the ship finally snapped, right between the third and fourth funnels. Eyewitnesses in the Titanic's lifeboats watched in horror. In the words of one survivor, the bow broke off with a sound like thunder, and soon began its plunge. It was closely followed by various pieces of the ship that crashed into the ocean as the hull and superstructure pulled apart. The heavier these pieces were, the more quickly they sank. The bow probably hit the bottom before the stern piece, its tremendous force driving it into the ocean floor. A few minutes later, the stern hit bottom even harder, also sinking deep into the mud. For the next several hours, bits and pieces from the ship scattered down to the ocean floor. These were the things found lying in the debris field. The ocean is a quiet and fairly stable place. After the Titanic's final plunge, she lay at a depth of 12,460 feet, where changes happen over tens of years rather than days. First to disappear would have been any soft organic material such as food, and then human bodies, the flesh and bones rapidly devoured by fish and crustaceans. Any bones they missed would have been slowly dissolved by the salt water. Clothing would also have gradually vanished over the years. While we did not find any human remains on our dives, we did discover some chilling evidence. As we were studying our Angus pictures, a disturbing image appeared. Two matching shoes lying side by side. It was quite clear they had not landed there by accident. It was as if some invisible person were still wearing them. Before long, another pair of shoes appeared on our Angus footage lying on the bottom in the same way as the first pair. And then we saw yet another pair. There was no doubt about it. We were looking down on the graves of these poor victims, their bodies long gone. I had hoped that any new expeditions that visited the wreck of the Titanic would leave it in as peace as they did. To my great disappointment, a French group backed by Swiss and American investors went down to the wreck during the summer of 1987 to gather artifacts from the debris field and bring them up to the surface. In my opinion, this was done purely for profit and shows a great disrespect for the grave site of the victims of the disaster. As survivor Ava Hart said to me, I'm violently opposed to it. For anyone to go down there and take those things is an act of piracy. Those plates they brought up could have been the ones my father ate his last meal from. It is a small comfort to know that at least no profit will be made from selling these artifacts in the United States. A resolution has been introduced in the U.S. Congress banning anyone from making a profit with the Titanic memorabilia in the United States. Congress has also already passed legislation calling for the wreck to be made into an international memorial and left undisturbed. My own treasure from the Titanic is in my mind's eye. The first view of the Titanic on our second dive will stay with me forever. 
the huge black shape of the bow looming out of the darkness. Altogether, I visited the Titanic nine times. I got to know her very well. As we landed on her decks and went inside her ravaged interior, I relived the famous scenes from the 1912 tragedy and the actual spots where they had taken place. After each dive, I would come back amazed at what I had seen. The loss of the Titanic was as saddening to the people of that time as the assassination of President John F. Kennedy was to a later time. Something seemed lost forever. People's view of the world is shaken up because of such tragedies. The most recent example is the loss of the space shuttle Challenger. As with the Titanic, too much confidence was placed in technology. In both cases, the power of nature was overlooked. It seems that we still have something to learn from the Titanic. The Titanic is truly gone for good. For that, I'm sad, but content. The bottom of the ocean is a peaceful place. In future, when I think of the Titanic, I will see her bow rising, her bow sitting upright on the bottom, finally at rest. Epilogue. Ruth Becker was reunited with her mother, sister, and brother on the Carpathia. Her family later moved to the United States, where Ruth eventually married, raised three children, and taught school. She retired to Santa Barbara, California, where she died on July 6, 1990, aged 90. Jack Thayer saw his mother as soon as he reached the top of the ladder to the deck of the Carpathia. She was overjoyed to see him, but sad to discover that her husband had not survived. Jack later wrote a book about his experiences called The Sinking of the SS Titanic. Harold Bride collapsed when he reached the deck of the Carpathia. He soon recovered and, despite badly frozen feet, spent most of the trip to New York helping the Carpathia's radio operator send out news of the disaster. Jack Phillips, Milton Long, Captain Smith, and more than 1,500 others did not survive.